All right. So welcome to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Guide to Color Theory. It's by Louisa. It's me. Hi. Um, I am the director of the front-end engineering program at the Turing School of Software and Design. We are a seven-month seven long developer training program based out of Denver. Um, I'm WeCB on Twitter. Um, and a little bit of background about me. I had a very nice introduction, but um, a little bit of background about me. I've been a designer for about 12 years, and I switched over to focusing on code about five years ago. Um, and I, I love color theory. Like, I think it's just a really interesting combination of like science and design and aesthetics and just like human factors. So it's a, it's a really fun topic to talk about, and it's a really it's a really important it's an important topic because it can have a huge impact on your users. Um, I'm also mostly from the big square states, and so I'm not really like used to all the humidity. So that kind of means that this is my current hair situation. Ah, uh, yeah. So that's just, just a disclaimer. That, that's pretty much where I'm at. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm qualified to speak about color and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because I wanted to be one of them. So you can trust me. Uh, even though I was missing like the, the four primary qualifications to be one of them, which is the, you know being a turtle and a teenager and a mutant and a ninja. But that's fine. Um, so. For this talk, we've got six sections. We're going to talk about color groups. We're going to talk about color associations. We'll be talking about the color wheel. We'll be talking about color combinations. We'll be talking about properties and terms, because you've got to be able to talk about it. And we'll be talking about accessibility, because it's important and you should worry about it. So let's get started. Let's do it. So. When we talk about color theory, you need to kind of start at the beginning. You have to like, build your foundation, and that means we're going to talk about color groups. So there are essentially three big buckets that all colors fall into. They are warm, cool, and neutral. So let's dig into it. Let's talk about it a little bit. So warm colors um, are going to be sort of like your reds through your, through your yellows. Um, and these are generally thought to be very positive and energetic. So these are colors, like colors in this group tend to act, have actually been shown to have a physical effect on people. They can raise your blood pressure, they can in, uh, increase your respiration, um, they can even enhance your metabolism. And so if you think about the kinds of brands that often use uh, colors in this, in, this, in this color group, they're often trying to communicate like fun or playfulness. Um, or in like the case of like McDonald's, they're trying to like, one, encourage you to want to eat more and then also kind of move you through the store faster so they can you know, sell more high quality hamburgers. Um, then we have the, the cool color group. So again, colors in this group are um, kind of like basically the opposite of our warm color group. So they're going to be a little bit calmer, a little bit more soothing, a little more relaxing. Um, you get like your greens, your blues, and like your purples in this range. Um, colors in this group are often associated with stability and composure. And again, if you think about the types of brands that are using these colors, um, they're, they're, often, they're often trying to like really um, encourage you to trust them. So you'll see a lot of like banks and hospitals and insurance companies that tend to have their branding skewing a little bit more towards the cool side of the color spectrum. Um, then we have neutral colors. Uh, these can you know, sort of skew either warm or cool, depending on the specific blend of the color. Um, so you'll see these, these top three colors are a little bit cooler, and then the bottom three, or the bottom two, I can count, it's fine. The bottom two colors um, are a little bit warmer. Um, and so it's kind of, so, so neutrals are often basically, uh, they're used most often as like the, the base or foundation of your color palette, and then a warmer or cool tone might be pulled in as an accent color. Um, so. Uh, our final color group, our group that I'm going to be talking about, is a non-color group, but we're going to talk about mutants a little bit. So um, they tend to also have, you know, fairly specific uses, um, and the use cases you'll see them in is, is, you know, generally pretty, pretty focused. So if you think about like the X-Men or Godzilla or the Turtles, um, they have. They have, they have very specific use cases, um, and they also have very strong cultural associations, which leads us to color associations. So. Whether we realize it or not, um, colors have very, very strong associations built into them. So if you pick a color that your users don't like, they're going to be like, 
pushed away from using your site or using your product simply because the, the, we have so we have such strong connection to color and we have we relate to it so intensely that it can it can actually like push people away. So. Um, and, and what, but what these, what these meanings that we have about colors can be, are very subjective. So they can change or, or vary based on um, the communities or the cultures that we grew up in. Um, so, uh, so some colors can have, very, have, have one specific meaning in one culture and a very different meaning in another culture. So if you think about the color white, um, in, in most Western cultures, it's associated with like purity and cleanliness and maybe like a fresh start or a new beginning. Um, and then in, in other cultures, in some Eastern cultures, um, it is associated with death. And it's often like the color that is worn at, at funerals. It's like a color associated with mourning. Um, so you know you can have these two, these, this one color, but two pretty, pretty vastly different meanings associated with it. So it's important to understand, understand the, the associations that are, are bound to a specific color as you're applying it to your product or, or your team. Um, so, when we're talking about color associations, red is a color that has some of the strongest associations bound to it. Um, it can be very polarizing. It's a very passionate color. Um, it can be associated with love, and it can also be associated with like, like the devil, right? So it's a very polarizing color. If you think about the turtles, we have Raph, like good old Raphael, good old Raph. Um, and if we think about him, he is very strongly bound to these cultural associations that we have with red. So red is this very passionate color, and so is Raphael. He's like the hothead of the group, right? So he's, he's a little moody, moody, he's kind of a Jersey boy, he gets a little sassy sometimes. Um, and he's just this very like intense character, and he has a lot of feelings. Sometimes, like when he's, when he's happy, he's really happy, and when he's angry, he's very mad. And so if we think about some of these like big sort of terms that are often associated with red, we have like determination, we have anger. Raphael gets a little bit angry sometimes. He's a very intense character, which are all things that are bound to red really intensely. Um, if we think about orange, orange is, it, you still get some of that like intensity and that, that energy from red, but it's a little bit softened, it's a little toned down. If we think about, it's a little bit more playful, whereas red can be very intense and very like passionate. Orange is, is more playful and a little bit more goofy and a little bit more lighthearted. So if we think about the turtles, we have Mikey. Michelangelo, so he, he's like the goofball of the group, right? So he's gonna be a little bit more fun, a little bit easygoing. He's still very like active and engaging, but he's not the same level of intensity as, as Raphael. Um, so again, if we think about how we might see orange applied in, in like the real world, you'll often see it applied to like children's toys or like things that you really wanna just imply that you're having fun now, like you're having a good time. Um, then if we get into blue, so we're kind of hopping back over to the cool side of the color groups. Um, so blue is, is, is a very, um, it's a very centered, it's a very centered and calming color. And with the turtles, again, we have Leonardo. So Leonardo is like the leader of the group. He's like the grounding force of the turtles. He's very calm, he's very level-headed. He is able to sort of like read a situation and act appropriately. He's not going to just act out of instinct or, or just because he's upset like Raphael will. He is very much like this grounding force of the turtles. He's like the leader of the group. Um, he's also incredibly focused and dedicated to the team as a whole. So these are all, again, things that are, we see reflected in the color blue. Um, they're like people, uh, blue is associated with loyalty and intelligence and confidence. And these are all things that are reflected in Leonardo. Uh, then we have purple. And purple is a really interesting color. So the history of purple is pretty cool. So it was, historically, it's been really hard to access. The, 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 the dye to make purple was very expensive. It was really hard to get. And so the people who had it or who had access to it um, were often people that were in sort of like either like monarchies or uh, like the clergy. So they were, they were people who had um, access to money. Um, and that meant that they were often more educated than the rest of the population which meant that purple is often associated with like wisdom and creativity and um, like dignity. And then if we think of the turtles again, we have Donatello, and he's like the engineer of the group. He's the problem solver. He's always like, he's very like studious and he's industrious. He's still a little bit like, he can get a little goofy still, but like he's the one who's like, he's the problem solver. So he sort of, he really aligns with these sort of historical um, associations that we have with purple. And then we have neutral, and again, neutral is like the background that all of these other brighter, bolder colors can sort of rest on top of. Um, it is very centered, it's very calming. Um, and then, of course, we have splinter. So splinter is like the grounding force of the turtles. He is like the like consistent background, and like the turtles are all like the little accent colors that he is like supporting and, and working with. Um, so he's laying this like really solid foundation for them to kind of be themselves and grow into their own. It's great. Um, so now that we know these big buckets about col that all colors fall into, we can talk about the color wheel. 
So, or as I've heard it described, uh, the, the pizza of color. Um, so now that we can, we can start to talk about like the relationships between colors and uh, so the color, the color wheel essentially um, lets us understand the purity of colors and then also how they are created. So it helps us understand a little bit more of like the nitty gritty behind what's going on under, behind the scenes. So we start off with primary colors. So primary colors are pure colors. So these are going to be red, blue, and yellow. So all colors come from primary colors. Uh, you cannot blend other two colors together to create a primary color. They are like, they're like your source of truth when it comes to colors. Um, so, but they are, they're the base for all other colors. All, color, all other colors are made from combining red, blue, and yellow. Um, and when we talk about the turtles, we got Leonardo and Raphael. So again, we have this hot, cool dynamics. We have, um, again, like Leonardo's in the cool color group. Uh, Raphael's in the warm color group. They are the most intense, like passionate colors that we um, have, the personality types. Um, their, their personalities are the most like intense and like pure. Um, they butt heads a little bit more. They, are, they can kind of like, uh, kind of get each other going a little bit. Um, but they also can't like balance each other out. So if Raphael gets really wound up, Leo's gonna be there to like bring him back down a little bit and kind of calm him down. So they, you, get, you get this hot, cool dynamic, but they really, they balance each other really effectively and really well. Then we have secondary colors. So secondary colors are created by blending in equal amounts uh, two primary colors. So you take like, um, like, Red and yellow blended together is going to be orange. So essentially, like you can just take these two colors, two primary colors, and blend them together in equal amounts, and you end up with a secondary color. Um, and then when we come to the turtles again, we have Donatello and Michelangelo. So we still have that hot, cool dynamic. Like we, Mikey, Mikey's a little bit goofy. He's like the party guy, and then Donatello is a little bit more studious and a little bit more focused. Um, but they don't really butt heads the same way that. Uh, Raphael and Leonardo do because they're secondary colors. So their personalities are a little bit toned down, they're a little bit less intense, but they're still these really bold, punchy colors that are still very, like, very opinionated and have a lot of opinions about things. Uh, cool. So now that we understand uh, some of how color, where colors come from, we understand a little bit of like the basics of the color wheel, we can start to talk about combining colors. Um, because, as we all know, uh, Making a color palette can be a little bit overwhelming. It can sometimes seem like it's not going to be that big a deal, and then it just turns into like, like a vacuum of sadness. Trying to find like a nice color palette, it can be hard. So we're going to talk about uh, some basic strategies for to kind of like help you think about approaching color palettes and how where to get started and how to how to roll with that. So. Uh, to get started, when we're on the color wheel, we have uh, the first sort of most simple type of color combination is a complementary color combination. And this is two colors that sit directly across the color wheel from each other. And they, um, so you're going to end up with a very high contrast pairing. Like in this example, we have this sort of like a rich purple and then a bright yellow. Um, so they're going to be very high contrast, which means that you're going to get, they're going to be, like, you'll have a, a pretty high, a pretty, a pretty great difference in, in val uh, value, so the lightness and darkness of a color. Um, but it doesn't, they don't always look super nice because they are so high contrast. So when you actually like butt them up against each other, uh, that, that boundary edge between them might actually have a little bit of visual vibration. So that, that line between the two actually might kind of, kind of vibrate a little bit and it might not be super nice. Um, so to kind of get around that, we have this concept of a split complementary color. So a split complementary is basically you take um, a complementary color combination, and then one of them, you go up a tick or down a tick on the color wheel to kind of soften that combination just a little bit. So it's a little bit less, um, a little bit less high contrast, um, a little bit softer. You'll see a lot of sports teams are like leveraging split complementary color combinations because they're bright and punchy, but they're not necessarily like, um, they don't necessarily like fight too bad. Like when you actually look at them, they don't really like fight too much. Uh, then we have this concept of triads. So a triad is essentially you take a triangle and you drop it on the color wheel and you end up with a really equally distributed uh, combination of colors. Um, and again, you get a really uh, vibrant, bright combo um, without having to, and you, you, kinda, you can either get um, a couple of cool colors and a warm color or a couple of cool colors and a warm color. And it, just, it breaks it up really nicely and you get a, you get a nice range of tones. Um, then we have a tetradic uh, color combination. This is when you take a, a rectangle and you drop that on the color wheel. Um, and that means that you end up with the turtles. Um, and this is as close as they get to conspiracy theories. So we've got, so we have, we have the turtles here and like what may have seemed like an arbitrary combination of colors just picked out of a hat willy-nilly is actually very intentional. 
So we can see that we've got this very equally, like equally balanced, um, very carefully crafted combination of colors that gives us this very um, soft, uh, not soft, but a very like uh, balanced color combination um, and a really nice mix of hot, cool, and then very aggressive and slightly softer um, uh, combinations and relationships between colors and characters. So there's a lot of contrast, but there's not necessarily conflict. Mm. So now, so now that we have, now that we kind of understand the color wheel, we understand how to make, like how to start making some color combinations. Um, now we're going to talk about color properties. So this is essentially going to give us the vocabulary to be able to speak about color a little bit more effectively. So we kind of, so when we're when we're working with it, we can we can speak a little bit better to, uh, to it. We can explain it to our teams a little bit more effectively. Um, and it also just makes you like really fun at parties. You can just show up and be like, hey, grandma, guess what? So. Um, it's really good for holiday gatherings, pro tip. So, um, so we're going to talk about this. Let's dive right in. So first, we're going to talk about hue. So hue is essentially, um, it's almost like a synonym for color. It is like a pure color. So these are going to be, so something that could be considered a hue is essentially like the colors that you might find in a, like an eight pack of crayons. So the colors that have names. So you could say like, like red or blue or green, the colors that you can really kind of you can identify a name with a word. Those are often, um, those are often referred to as hues. Uh, so, cool. Then we have value. And so value describes the lightness or darkness of a color. And it has to do with how much light that color is uh, allowing to reflect back into your eye. So if we have a really dark color, or that is going to have a low value, because that means that it is absorbing more light than it is reflecting back to you. And then if we have a, a high value, that means that it's a light color, which is reflecting more light back into your eye than it is like absorbing away from you. So in this example, we have this really sort of deep purple that is a low value, and then this really bright yellow that is a high value. So we have hue, which is gonna be the pure, a pure tone, a pure color, and then we have value, which is the lightness or darkness of a color. Then we have tone. So tones are made by mixing a pure color with a neutral or a grayscale color. And for this, for this talk, we're gonna use, I'm just gonna use white and black. Um, so essentially a tone will be a little bit softer than the original color. So it essentially kind of creates a range of, a range within a, a color. So, so if you have like created a complementary color combination and you're like, this is a little too intense, you could start to work with tones to kind of soften one of those colors a little bit. So, uh, so tone would be just like the, the, pure, the, pure, the pure color. And then um, within there we have tints. So a tint would be if you added white to a color, so you had a, like a range uh, going towards, to, towards a lighter color. And then a shade would be if you added black and you went down towards a really dark color. So then we have saturation. So saturation defines the range of purity of a color. And this is pretty interesting. So you go from having 100% saturated, so this very, this very bright, bold, sort of yellowy green color here, um, and then you have 0% saturated, which becomes this gray. And um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that um, a, a completely desaturated color, while it is gray, it's actually like tonal. So it pairs really, this is a great way to um, find a neutral color palette that works with an accent color. So if you're looking to find, um, if you want to, if you have like, if you have a warm color or a cool color that you really want to use as your, as your bright, punchy accent color, um, and then you want to have a neutral background for that, desaturating one of that, that accent color to that tonal gray and then finding like a range of tones within that tonal gray is a really great way to build out that, that background because it's gonna, it's gonna work really effectively with that really bright, punchy, super saturated color. Um, and since we're speaking about tonal gray, um, tonal gray is actually pretty interesting. So when you're, when you're actually painting, the way you get tonal gray is you can take two colors that are on equal, so tonal gray are like just to desaturate a color when you're painting. You take two colors that are on opposite sides of the color wheel and you blend them in equal amounts and eventually you get to this tonal gray. So essentially the way you get to that gray color is by combining all of these elements by the, these, these colors together, and then you end up with this tonal gray that will work really effectively with either color that you started from. And so when we bring it back to the turtles, splinter is your tonal gray. So, so if we think about this, he's like at the center of them, he's at the core of the turtles. He is an equal combination of all of his students, right? So he is, he's at the center of them. If you combine any one of them in equal amounts, you're gonna hit splinter, because he's at the core of their being. He raised them from tiny radioactive babies. 
So, so Splinter is essentially the tonal gray of the turtles. All right. So now, so now that we know we have vocabulary, we can speak about color, we understand the color wheel, um, now we're going to talk about some accessibility strategies because it's important. And we need to, like, as, as was mentioned earlier this morning, like, there is a large percentage of the population that has a color vision deficiency. So that's about, it's about four and a half percent of the population in the U.S. That's like 13 million people. That's a lot. That's a lot of humans. Um, so what's important, like, one of the, one of the so most sort of straightforward ways to help, to help avoid um, causing problems or struggles for your, for your users who are, are or some, have some amount of color blindness, is to not rely exclusively on color to deliver a message to your users. So, as an example, let's talk about forms. Who doesn't love a good form? <laughs> Super nice. So, if we look at this example, we have, we're using red and green to show an error message. Um, like, this form hasn't successfully been submitted, and we're using red and green to show which field was problematic. Um, Cool, like red, green, that makes sense. Like green is success, red is error. Uh, if you can see, if you can like, if you have like full color vision, that works great, that's awesome. Um, what's not awesome is that the most common form of color blindness is red, green color blindness. So what you're essentially doing, if this is your approach to this, is that you are setting up a not, you're setting up a pretty significant portion of your user base to fail. So I put, I put this form through a, a red, green color, a red, green color vision deficiency simulator here, and now we can see that it completely falls down. Like, this didn't submit, I have no idea what happened. Like, I don't know what I did, I don't know what I didn't do, I'm not sure what's happening, and I don't know how to fix it. So if I was a user, I'd be super upset, I'd be, well, depending on what I was trying to do, if I was trying to like submit my taxes, yeah, I'd be really upset. But, um, you know, like, you are, we're not helping them, we're making it harder for them. So, and again, the, the solution to this is to not rely solely on colors. So, we can combine color with other visual communication tools to allow us to be more effective and to be more effective with communicating to our users. So, in this, in this example, we're essentially using the same form. We've made a slight adjustment. We're still using red and green on the, around the inputs to dictate uh, what, what in, where, uh, which inputs failed. But now we've added icons and we've added an error message. So we are communicating, we're, we're like, we're using our words to explain to our users what's going on. And we're also using um, some pretty straightforward um, icons. I forgot the word for icon, it's tough. Um, so we're using some pretty, some pretty, pretty like clear icons. They may not be, like as we, as we mentioned early, again earlier this morning, like universal icons aren't really a thing, but if you keep them simple, like, this is this this uh, combined with uh, with an error message and some some sort of like visual other visual cues. This is this is this will work. So now when we put this through a color vision deficiency simulator, um, now we see that this still holds up. I can still figure out what's going on and what I need to fix to make this form go. Cool. So essentially, like this is a great example of using color to highlight and complement what's already on the page. So we already have icons, we already have an error message, and we're using co we're not relying on color to be the, the primary uh, delivery method of this message. We're we're using it to complement that. So if we bring it back to the turtles, um, so we take a look at these guys, and like we are really so far we've been just completely relying on color to tell these guys apart. But really, if you think about it, they all kind of look the same. Like, they don't have noses, you can't really see, they don't have different, like, they just, they look very similar. But, what we can, what we, how we can tell them apart is with their weapons. <laughs> so, if I put, I put the turtles through a color vision deficiency simulator, and so now, you still know exactly who's who, because they all have very different and distinct weapons. So again, like, we're not relying solely on color to communicate which turtle is which, we're just complementing what's already on the page or the, you know, the reptile, it's fine. And so, so now we are communicating more effectively and we've essentially, we've just made the turtles accessible. We did it, hooray. So, to sum up, um, we covered six parts and they covered colors and conspiracy theories. Um, my research and references were pretty much exclusively being a kid in the 90s uh, and, Pretty sure I nailed it. <laughs> All right.